Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We've been making cheese in Wisconsin since before we were even a state, which may be one reason why we win so many awards for it. It's what happens when a whole state dreams in cheese. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Welcome to Spill and Dish, a new podcast from the Specialty Food Association. Founded in 1952, SFA is the leading trade association and source of information about the $175 billion specialty food industry. We champion the food producers, retailers, and other buyers who make up the specialty food world. If you want to know more about membership, visit specialtyfood.com. In each episode, we want to share the stories behind the products made and sold by our members who are helping shape the future of food. You can listen and discover the inspiration, recipe, craft, culture, ingredients, and production methods that help answer the question, what makes specialty food special? I'm today's host, Megan Rooney, Program Development Manager at SFA. We're excited to bring you today's episode and so happy to be working with Heritage Radio Network a nonprofit podcast network covering the world of food, drink, and agriculture, and expanding the way eaters think about food. Today's very special guest is Sean Askinosi, the visionary founder and CEO of Askinosi Chocolate, renowned for his sustainable practices and commitment to direct trade. With each delicious bar, he has revolutionized the chocolate industry while making a positive impact on the lives of cocoa farmers worldwide. Recently, Sean was inducted into the Specialty Food Association's Hall of Fame at the 2023 Summer Fancy Food Show. Congratulations again, and welcome, Sean. Thank you. Wow, what an intro. I think I should just quit right now. (laughs) Thank you for that. Yeah, of course. Thanks for joining us. Um, So my first question is, can you just tell us a bit more about what Askinosi Chocolate produces? Sure. We are... Well, we were one of the first bean-to-bar chocolate makers in the United States uh, about 16, 17 years ago. And we just make chocolate from cocoa beans that we source in four different locations, uh, Tanzania, the Amazon, Ecuador, and the Philippines. And we take those beans and turn them into chocolate bars and other products and sell them throughout the United States and some Canada, a little bit in Europe and tiny amount in Japan. And we're a very small family business with about 20 employees. And my daughter works with me. She's our chief marketing officer and part owner in the business. And uh, as I said, I've been doing it for about 17 years. And one of my primary responsibilities in the company is is sourcing those beans. So on Tuesday, I'll take my 49th origin trip since I started the company. And uh, one of the hallmarks of our company is a program called Chocolate University. So on Tuesday, when I go to Tanzania, I'll have... 15 local high school students in tow 
Um, this is something we've been doing for 13 years. Um, it's a it's an international business immersion experience for those students, and we pay for all of them uh, the entire trip. And uh, so that's a little bit about what we do. Wow, that's incredible. And can you tell listeners a bit about your background and how you got your start with the company? I was a criminal defense lawyer for almost 20 years. I specialized in serious felony cases, and I loved that work, and I thought I'd do it for the rest of my life. And I reached a point in my career where I thought I would be ready for something else. I wanted to do something else, and I just didn't know how to do anything besides the courtroom. And so I just started to develop some hobbies, and they all revolved around food. And I went to Ecuador in 2005, so about 18 years ago this summer. And that's when I knew I was going to wind down my law practice, quit that, and start making chocolate. So here I am. That's amazing. And how has what you learned as a criminal defense lawyer, how has that helped you run a food business? <laughs> um, well, that's a great question. I, I think that my experience with criminal law hasn't really helped me that much. But I do think my experience as a lawyer has helped me. So I, in the in the very beginning, we started buying cocoa beans direct from farmers. So we never used a broker or a distributor to get cocoa beans. It was always direct. And that means something as simple as going to the place and helping farmers open a bank account so that we can pay them directly. And that process of importing cocoa beans into the United States can be kind of a daunting process. But I think my law career um, maybe helped me not be so intimidated by that process because there's a lot of hoops to jump through, a lot of regulations and laws to follow. And so I think it gave me just enough of a boost. And that, and I've, I have found that to be helpful throughout the years. You know, we're still importing cocoa beans all these years later. And I find that my prior life you know, has helped me in many ways. Um, the other way it's helped me is as a criminal defense lawyer, I spent a lot of time looking for people, <laughs> just trying to find witnesses. And, and I, I also have employed a lot of those same skills in trying to find farmers, obviously for different reasons, but, um, and just not giving up much like a journalist would an investigative journalist turning over every stone asking someone if they can introduce them to someone else who might know more. That's how we found farmers essentially in all of these locations. Cool. Yeah. So it seems like a lot of those lawyer skills translate. How many right. years, um, you mentioned that you've been involved in the industry for 17 years. Can you speak a bit more to that? Well, the first chocolate bar came off the line in May of 2007, but it took me about a year to locate uh, the equipment. Back then, since nobody was really doing this, you couldn't, you couldn't go online and find the equipment. So I had to buy it in different places around the world. And that took about a year or two. Then I had to acquire the beans. So I started doing that in Ecuador and Mexico. So, and I had to go there to do it. So that took, as I said, that took a couple of years to get set up and to um, renovate our factory location in Springfield, Missouri. And um, so in the very beginning, we started selling these chocolate bars, um, bean to bar chocolate bars, and they were very expensive. And people were asking, who in the world is going to pay, you know, back then it might have been $8, who's going to pay $8 for a chocolate bar. But we started selling, I think our first um, store was in San Francisco. And we started really branch out from there and sell to specialty food stores around the country. And that's what we're doing to this day. We don't have a distributor right now. It's just all direct to stores. Wow. That's impressive. And where did your love of chocolate and food come from? Did your parents encourage you to try new foods when you were younger? My, I, I, 
I am not one of those people, this may be a surprising, but I'm not one of those people who's had a lifelong love of chocolate. However, um, I have had um, a lifelong love of food and trying to understand where it comes from. My grandparents were farmers, just very small farm um, in Southwest Missouri. And they had some cows and a big garden and a few crops. And they were not highly educated people. They lived a simple life. They worked very hard. And I spent a lot of time growing up on their farm because our house was about 30 minutes from theirs. And so I was used to chores and baling hay and breaking ice in the pond. And as I got older, especially in high school, I wasn't very nice about it. Um, I didn't want to do that work on the farm. I didn't even really want to be there. Um, and I wish I could, you know, sort of rewind the tape on some of that stuff. But despite my attitude toward it, um, as the years passed by, I began to really appreciate what it was to be on their farm and to work on their farm and especially them. So the work that I do with farmers now is absolutely directly connected to the inspiration of my grandparents who lived this simple farming, hardworking life. And that is really more than anything else, the inspiration behind what we do. And yes, I love chocolate. Um, but that the, the people, the, the people who inspired me are the ones that drive this as opposed to um, the love of the food. It's the people behind the food that I'm really um, motivated by. And so when I, when I started, I, I, as I said, I didn't have any hobbies. So I started with a big green egg and I, mm -hmm. I started cooking outdoors and then I started baking and, mm -hmm. And from baking, I, I eventually landed to chocolate. At first, I thought I was going to have a cupcake business. Back then, it was Sex in the City, and everybody was talking yeah. about it. <laughs> and and um, I actually made a trip to New York just to visit Magnolia Bakery, thinking I would be inspired and go home and start a cupcake business. But I've made thousands of cupcakes. But I, when I went there, the people behind the counter weren't very nice. <laughs> and yeah. so... <laughs> I remember that experience and it's not like one person turned me off from the entire cupcake business, but I just <laughs> thought, Oh, that's not a very good experience that I just had. Um, and I, I just kept experimenting and thinking and, and, you know, I was making, I was making chocolate desserts and really not having zero idea where it came from. I, I didn't even um, know I was literally using it. And I thought it was just like an ingredient that somehow was like chemically produced or manufactured. I didn't, I had no idea it came from a bean, no idea. Mm -hmm. I, you know, within a few short months of this idea coming to my, come into my head of making it from scratch, I was in the Amazon learning wow. from farmers. Uh, this is 18 years ago. That's so cool. And as someone who loves chocolate and loves baking, I can really appreciate that story. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, what were some obstacles that you faced in bringing your brand to market? Well, the first obstacle was, and I remember talking to um, the people at Scharfenberger um, who were really the first to do bean to bar chocolate um, in a small batch format. And they sold to Hershey in August, 2005. But I remember talking to the founders right before they sold and um, they were asking me about my experience in science or any kind of background in science. And I didn't have any. So I, I think I went to the university of Missouri and I took one, I took a forestry class that I never went to. I remember going to the mm -hmm. midterm final. And so I was a political science major. You know, I didn't have any, I, I knew I was going to go to law school. So the biggest obstacle for me was <clears throat> zero business classes, zero science, mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm not mechanical. So those are not really great foundations to start a business that is, that, re that really does require 
a pretty significant amount of science to understand what's happening in making chocolate and be, not being able to fix things. And oh, by the way, I really can't read a PL. So um, those were really huge obstacles. And, and candidly, they, they have remained weaknesses for me all of these years. And so what I've tried to do is I've tried to, you know, I've, I've tried to have some humility around those um, weaknesses and, and have people around me who can make up for that, you know, who understand, mm-hmm. um, um, P and L and cash flow and can really teach that to me. And so I've learned about those things over the years and it's helped. Um, but those were really the first obstacles to bringing it to more. I mean, just how much, like, what are you, what are you going to price your product at? Just very simple things were obstacles for me. Mm-hmm. And piggybacking off of that question, what are some things that you'd do differently if you could start over? Hmm. You know, the um, if I could start over again, I, I'd go back to really the same answer that I gave before. I would teach myself more about um, finance and cash flow management. We're a very conservative company financially. What that means is we, we really don't have any debt to speak of, very little debt. And that's in, in large measure because my wife is, we've been married for 35 years. She's very conservative financially and has pretty much just said, we're not taking on debt. (laughs) And so, you know, we own our real, our real estate that the factory is on. So we own the factory in that. Um, and there's some small debt on that, but, but I, I think if I was going to change anything, I would just, I would, I would try to teach myself more about that I try to teach myself more about cash flow management and finance, and I talk to young people all the time. Um, in fact, as I mentioned, you know we're taking fifteen high school students to Tanzania on Tuesday, and I was meeting with them last night, um, and we're getting ready for the trip. And I will speak to them throughout the trip and have this past semester about this thing that we're talking about right now, which is I don't care what you're career is going to be. Um, but I really encourage young people to take finance and accounting in college just Mm -hmm. to have an understanding and, um, really improve their financial literacy skills. So I guess that that's a long way of saying that's probably what I would do. If I was going to change anything, I would improve my financial literacy. Mm, Makes sense. What was the biggest surprise about getting involved in the specialty food trade? I think the the biggest surprise for me has been trying to untangle and understand the grocery business. So there's, um, there are buyers that are responsible for bringing in products. And I think it's pretty easy to understand when it's a one store or two store, or maybe a three store location, but when you start dealing with um, bigger operations that have multiple units and multiple buyers, there there's a um, there are many layers of complexity, um, and that ha- that really has been a surprise, and something that even all these years later we've not fully um, uh, decoded, if you will. Mm-hmm. It's, it's complicated, and so. Um, that we're, we're still learning that, but that has really been a surprise for me is, is learning about the grocery business, um, especially at scale and to do that without a distributor. Um, that has, we've really had to learn a lot and, 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 and we've had to adapt with the changes in the industry and our industry that is both specialty food and chocolate just since I've been doing this for 17 ish years has really um, gone through a lot of changes and specifically in my category of chocolate, it's not the same um, as when we started. Now we don't have to convince buyers what bean to bar chocolate is. Mm -hmm. Now we need to convince them that um, we're 
a brand among now 300, 350 chocolate makers in the United States, that mm -hmm. we're a brand worth bringing in and that we are um, reliable and high quality. And so this, this is a, a big, big change, you know, over 17 years to go from three or four chocolate makers to 300 or more. And, and customers are not as, and you're, you, you, Megan, you're a chocolate customer and maybe you can mm -hmm. verify this, but, um, <clears throat> back then the, when we started, customers were very, very interested in origin and, and, mm -hmm. and so they wanted to know about, you know, where did this chocolate, where did the beans come from that make this chocolate bar? And they were very interested in exotic origins. Like, oh, I want to try that thing from Papua New Guinea or from Indonesia or Vietnam or whatever. That has changed. And um, I was talking with some colleagues about this just last week at the Fancy Food Show who agree. And the way it's changed is customers aren't as focused on where the beans came from as they are now on the quality of the chocolate. And customers mm -hmm. are really very, very discerning, I think now, and they, they will not um, be satisfied with um, a chocolate bar that might not be the highest, absolute best premium quality if it's from an exotic origin the way they might have been 15 years ago, now they want high quality chocolate. And that to me is, and that's the primary driver for their buying decisions as opposed to, oh, this is a really interesting sounding origin. Yeah, I think I would agree. Just with shortened intention spans in general, I think yeah. people are more yeah. so like, let's get to the point, give me something that tastes really great than um, learning about chocolate right. and learning about yeah. what different beans taste like from different origins. Well, and, and I also should add too, I, I'm, I also want to say that customers, while they may not care specifically about named origin, they do very much care that the beans are ethically sourced. Mm -hmm. And so regardless of the origin of the bean, customers are caring more and more that the chocolate was made without the use of enslaved children, for example, uh, that the farmers received a really good high price for the beans. And this is something that we've been publishing on our website for a very long time. Customers can go and see what we paid farmers and how, how that price compared against the fair trade price, which is much higher, uh, how it compares against the world market price. They can see that we profit share with farmers. So for example, next Tuesday, when I go to Tanzania, our financials will be in Swahili. And we've always done that to translate our financials into the language of the uh, farmers at origin so they can understand how we calculate their profit share. Customers absolutely care about that. Uh, and they're caring more and more about um, how this product is sourced and how all of, um, I, I think this is happening across the spectrum in specialty food. Yeah, definitely, for sure. Um, how has your brand evolved over the years? The, the, I think one of the ways that we've evolved is we have, um, we've deepened our commitment, um, at our, we've deepened our commitment to community service. We, we started chocolate university the month that we sold our first chocolate bar in 2007 to engage young people around our chocolate factory in the business so that we could inspire them really to two things. Number one, that small business can be a force for good in the world. And number two, that there's a world for them beyond Springfield, Missouri. And mm -hmm. over the years, we've really um, deepened that commitment more and more and more and at origin. <clears throat> so for example, even though we're a company of 20 people, uh, we support an after school program for, for after school program for boys and girls around in and around the village where we buy beans in Tanzania. And since we started these after school programs, we've had close to 10,000 young people graduate from wow. these programs because we have a commitment there in the village. We have someone who works for us who lives in the village who's Tanzanian. She's been there for six years. Just talked to her this morning on WhatsApp. Um, and we've 
another example of our deepened commitment is about six years ago, we started a feminine hygiene program. So all of the girls that are part of this program have feminine hygiene products every month. This is a very big deal because otherwise they wouldn't be able to go to school. They'd have to stay home. Mm -hmm. And so um, three years ago, we built a preschool in the village that the farmers run and manage. And so I think the way the brand has evolved has really just deepened our commitment to something that we talk about a lot. And and I would say that these two words really sum it up and it's mutuality and kinship. And this goes back to what I was talking about with my grandparents. So the food is very important. However, the mutuality that we have and that we want to have with the people who grow this crop, you know, deepens and, and, and deepens over the years and that, mm-hmm. that we do have a true kinship with them. That's what we're after. That's the aspiration and the inspiration. Yeah. Investing in the community. Mm-hmm. That's great. So, um, I read about how the production of your chocolate is an extensive 70 step process. Can you tell us a bit more about this process and also where you find inspiration for new flavors and products? So you want me to sort of condense the process and just explain how we do it or? Yeah. Or maybe like tell us why 70 steps is required when you make your chocolate. Just a little overview. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, No, I appreciate that. And I won't give you a dissertation on chocolate making. (laughs) here. I will spare you that. Um, So we bring these beans into our factory and that's, you know, people could just sort of gloss over that. That's a big deal. We're one of the few people in the U S that actually import cocoa beans and make chocolate. And so we, our factory, we have a warehouse right behind the factory. We bring them in and we store them there from the origins that I've mentioned. And then we clean the beans there. We roast them in our factory. And I should say that I'm super excited because last week we got a new roaster. It's a Diedrich roaster and we haven't even, um, and it hasn't been turned on yet. We haven't hooked it up. Um, so we're really excited about that because we've had the same roaster for 17 years and we've fixed it time and time and time again. And it was so broken down and it had zero controls on it. You basically turn the roaster on in the morning and just kind of watch the temperature gauge. There's no okay. way. To control. So this is going to be a complete new learning process for us. And what's exciting is it's going to give us the opportunity to really dial in roasting temperatures that we that we didn't have the ability to do before and that has the biggest impact on flavor of any step in our process so roasting is where it all happens there is no other possibility to impact flavor other than roasting unless you add you know ingredients like coconut or um, a spice or some other kind of sugar that kind of sort of thing um but anyway, we roast the beans and then we uh, the, we have cocoa nibs from that and we grind those up in a universal. We bought a new universal from Scotland last year mm-hmm. and a 500 kilogram unit. And, and then we grind them there and add organic sugar and we then move it to a holding tank and it's chocolate at that point and just swirling around in a variety of holding tanks. And uh, that's pretty awesome, I have to say. And and then we temper the chocolate in our molding room, and then we deposit the tempered chocolate into polycarb molds, and they go through a cooling tunnel. And then from there, we um, use a flow wrapper for the cellophane. It's not really cellophane. It's called Nature Flex. It's a 100% home compostable wood pulp fiber that we've used forever since we started. And um, And that's it. That's in a nutshell. Um, and how we develop new flavors. My daughter, Lauren, um, that I mentioned earlier, is mm-hmm. the person who really spearheads that part of the business with our head chocolate maker, Brad. And um, so at this point, I am I am involved in that process, but I don't lead that process. And mm-hmm. we are continually. So at all times, we're experimenting with new flavors and new products to both be a leader in flavor development. So, you know, to do something new. Um, I think we've, we did, um, we did a sweet potato pie 
um, seasonal chocolate bar last Thanksgiving between Thanksgiving and <laughs> That's awesome. the holidays and um, with roasted marshmallows on the back. You know, so we're just doing really crazy things that we can just make one batch of. And that's something that we're going to continue to really accentuate in the coming two to three years is we're trying to have this sort of nimble ability to make small batches Mm -hmm. and not make any more of that. So make a batch and have those bars available and then that's it. And then we'll have a core line of bars that are available all of the time. And so that's something that is that we're working on to hopefully um, deploy within the next 12 to 24 months. That sounds awesome. And then what do you want people to know about Askinosie chocolate that they might not already know? That I, th- I think the most important thing to know about us is that um, we are not trying to change the world by these practices that we've been talking about. That's not our aim. And I can say personally, as the leader of the company and the founder of the company, that my aim in all of this that we've been talking about is to change myself. So while we may wave the flag of direct trade and talk about how great it is and these relationships that I talked about with farmers, some of these farmers I've been buying cocoa beans from for more than a decade, mm-hmm. same. Farmer. And that is not for me to say in a podcast interview like this, that I want listeners to say, Oh, that's the way I should do it. Or what I'm all, all I'm saying is this is the way we do it. It's not a prescription. It's just what the way we do it. And my hope at the end of all of it is that, that I myself have changed. How can I um, make my way through this life? Um, And as Joseph Campbell said, you know, can I find a life where I am joyfully participating in the sorrows of the world? And that's my, that's my aim. That's what I hope to do. And that is what I hope Askinosi chocolate is known for. Wonderful. We're almost out of time, but before you go, we'd like for you to participate in our final segment, Take Five, Five Questions for Our Guest. First, we'll pause for a break. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. There's a reason when you think of Wisconsin, you think cheese. Cheese is a huge part of Wisconsin's history and future. In Wisconsin, the state of cheese... The tradition of cheesemaking excellence began 180 years ago, before Wisconsin was recognized as a state. Immigrants traveled to settle in this lush, green hills of Wisconsin, bringing their cheesemaking traditions with them. These storied skills combined with the freshest milk available created a cheesemaking culture that is uniquely Wisconsin. Wisconsin's 1,200 cheesemakers, many of whom are third and fourth generation, continue to pass on old world traditions while adopting modern innovations in cheesemaking craftsmanship. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Welcome back. I'm Megan Rooney of SFA speaking with Sean Askinosi of Askinosi Chocolate. Let's jump into five questions for our final segment, Take Five. Question one, what is your favorite thing about the specialty food industry? The people, the people that I have met that have become my great friends, just, you know, lifelong friends that are in the industry that I count on as brothers and sisters. Question two, what is one thing that SFA has made easier for you as a founder and CEO of Eskinozi Chocolate? That's pretty easy, especially in the beginning. They brought buyers to us. There's no way we would have had the money or the reach to to see the numbers of buyers who would be interested in our in our product. So, by far, by far, it's 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 having the ability to be introduced to buyers at places like the Fancy Food Show that that was um, not replaceable. Great. 
Question three, if you weren't running a business, what would you be doing? Um, I'd probably be a, um, I'd probably be a chaplain in a hospital in a palliative care unit. Question four, what's the one piece of advice you'd give to a new food business? The one piece of advice would be, um, ask yourself continually how much is enough. I write about this in my book and uh, the, 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 one of the chapters is titled how much is enough. And I encourage business owners when they're developing their business plan and as they begin to, um, execute the plan over the years to ask how much is enough continually, that's a moving target, but it's a question worthy of asking and answering over and over again. So we can know where we are. Great. And the final question, five, how do you define specialty food? I define specialty food. This may not surprise you. I define specialty food by the people, the makers, and the those who bring it to market and to people who can appreciate the story of the food and the flavor and quality of the food. So to me, it's about the people. It's about the people who are making it and bringing it to market so that the customers can appreciate the story and the product itself. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Sean, for speaking with me today. And before we go, can you tell everyone where they can find you, what the title of your book is? Thank you. Well, and thanks for having me and what an honor. I, I appreciate this and the chance to talk to you and people can find us by going to askanosi.com. Um, that's our website. There's a lot of content there to learn more about how we source our beans and the relationships that we have with farmers. Uh, people can find us, of course, on the all the social channels using Askanosi Chocolate. I have a blog that I try to post in at least once a year um, seanaskenosi.com. And that's how people can reach me. Uh, there's a link on that website for people to email me questions that they might have. And, um, I do a lot of speaking around the country, um, on some of these topics that we've talked about. And that's another way that people can learn more about the, um, um, presentations that I give by going to seanaskenosi.com. And thank you for asking about the book. It's called Meaningful Work, The Quest to Do Great Business, Find Your Calling and Feed Your Soul. And it's available uh, on Amazon. Wonderful. You can find out more about this show at specialtyfood.com and heritageradionetwork.org. And remember to follow wherever you get your podcasts. Come back often to get to know the people who are shaping the future of food. And if you're in the food industry yourself, consider becoming a member of SFA by visiting our membership section on specialtyfood.com. Again, special thanks to Ask a Nosy Chocolate and to Heritage Radio Network, the world's pioneer food radio station. This is Spill and Dish, a Specialty Food Association podcast. Spill and Dish, a Specialty Food Association podcast, is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.